There we go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. You just have to le hit the got it button to get that big ridiculous box out of the way. Um, so these are webinars actually have, that have been organized with Ruth Peltier. So those of you who are here probably know Ruth. I want to take a minute to thank her. Um, she's done an amazing job and I can let you know what's coming up for the rest of this year. And actually we do have some coming in the new year as well, but I'll just let you know in October on the 12th, we're going to have a session on grandparents and the access to grandchildren in the event of a divorce. Uh, this is an issue that we hear about. So, you know, custody issues for a lot of seniors. Um, it's not always that obvious. So I think that's going to be a really interesting one. And at the same time, while we're talking about relationships and different issues, we are going to touch on um, the issue of living common law in Quebec uh, and what that means legally, because it is a little bit of an area that people don't necessarily know what their rights are or are not. Um, some of you who may follow the news may know that uh, have seen some pretty spectacular separations of common law partners, uh, particularly in Quebec. Um, but it's a good thing to be aware of. If in this part of your life, you're not interested in getting married again, we understand, but you do want to live with someone or have a serious relationship, there are a few things you should be aware of. And then on November 9th, this is a really important one. And I would say probably one of the things that we talk about the most or hear about in the most, and that's the rights of tenants, um, older tenants. What happens if you, you know, have a medical issue and you need to break your lease? What are your rights within your residence if you're living in a senior's residence? What do, are the particular issues that seniors should be aware of around their housing? So again, that's on November 9th. And then at the start of December, our most optimistic webinar, <laughs> travel safety and insurance during a pandemic. <laughs> I encourage you to join just so we can all collectively put good vibes out there that we will need this webinar. Um, but this is an issue and especially for seniors because travel insurance is a particular issue for this community. And then what are the newer risks or issues? What are your rights if heaven forbid you do travel somewhere and there is an outbreak of the pandemic or of the virus? So I encourage you to join, follow us on Facebook. They're all gonna be there with updates. They're listed on our website, which I'll put in the chat. Um, but for today, we are going to be focusing on the issue of, or the issues of returning to work or working as an older adult? And what are some of the things that you should know about? If you're thinking about going back to work part-time and you're not really sure how to approach it, or if you're in a situation where you're not sure that you're being treated the way you should be treated, what are your options? Who can you talk to? We've got some of them, you know, some great experts here today to talk to you. So I'm gonna stop talking, I promise. <laughs> and I'm gonna introduce our first guest. Um, some of you may know him. Uh, he's, he's a little bit famous, I, I would say, in this community. But so we're going to hear first from Leslie. Uh, I have a little bio here I'm going to read to you. So Leslie possesses many years of diverse management and human resource experience in the public, private, and not-for-profit sector for multiple industries. He's currently the executive director of La Passerelle, and he is the chair of the board of directors for SEDEC, the Community Economic Development and Employability Corporation, who help communities achieve economic success, taking economic development initiatives from idea action to sustainable results. <clears throat> I'm gonna turn this over to Leslie and he is going to share some of his expertise with us. Thank you again for joining. Leslie, over to you. It's, thanks, Vanessa. We never talked about my accordion certificate. We could do that. Maybe I, 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 I am trying to get Leslie to play the accordion during the intermission. We'll so far, see. I have had no luck. Just yeah, so. We'll see how that goes. And, and uh, Ruth, thanks for inviting me and Katya. Thanks for helping me set all this up. So, so yeah, as mentioned, I do have a, a lot of things to talk about in the next half hour. Um, I'll just wait for the slide to come up. So this morning, basically, what I'd like to do is, is to talk about 
um, the issues facing mature workers as they come back onto the workforce. And I'm using a lot of the experience that, that we've accumulated at La Passerelle to um, provide examples. And, and it's also based on a lot, of, a lot of what we've experienced and a lot of hearsay, well, not even hearsay, but a lot of what, uh, what's going on at La Passerelle. So, and then I'm gonna, um, I'm going to start talking about SEDEC a bit and the work that they do and, and how that fits into the coming back onto the workforce for mature workers. Um, again, if there are any questions, I, I guess it's going to be on the chat. Katja is going to be managing that. Go, go for the question. We can do more. questions when you're done. I mean, I'll okay. keep an eye on the chat to make sure nothing's missed. So okay. don't worry about it. I'll keep track of that. I love questions. Good. All right. More, more of you, less of me. It works. Okay. So here. Um, Katya, if I go ding, can you just go to the next page? That could be our secret thing there. Yeah, I was just trying to forward the slide and it just got stuck. There you go. Let me just figure this out. <clears throat> Yesterday, uh, while I was practicing, there was a fire alarm and, and the evacuation notice for the building is, is really intense. It's hard to ignore. Just like fingers crossed it doesn't happen again. All right. And if it does, don't worry about it. It's a safe building and we have sprinklers, so I might get wet. Okay, thank you, Katya. So, so an introduction. So Pascal, our roots, basically historically we were formed in the 80s or actually late 80s, early 90s uh, at a time when um, a lot of companies were heading down the 401. So we, we were in a situation where there's a whole layer of English middle management that all of a sudden had no more work or no opportunities. And um, there was a, a self-help group formed in the church just across the street from where we are. And uh, it was started by uh, Constance Middleton Hope, as some of you know. Um, and that that evolved over the years, and and in in the early nineties, or late nineties, ninety eight, we 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 partnered up with Emploi Quebec, Service Quebec now, um, to offer a fully subsidized bilingual program. So that's what Abasco does. We have an employment program. Our roots are important because our values are pretty much the same as they were back in the eighties. It's just we've adapted technology, and I think the most significant part is it's about. Um, the human aspect of it. It's, and I'm going to talk about a bit about this as well throughout the presentation, but looking for work isn't a technical thing. And a lot of people look at it as a technical, I'm going to do my CV, I'm going to like practice my interview, but there's so much more around it. So during the presentation, I'm going to try to explain everything. And again, I mean, La Passelle comes into this, but whether it's us or another employment service provider, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's the, it's the strategy that you should be looking at. Um, who we help? Our participants. I, I have a slide that I show in one of the workshops where it says, um, you know, inside every old person is a young person wondering what the hell happened. And, and that, that pretty much sums up our participants in the sense that, um, yeah, we might, we might physically be 45 and above, but when you think about it, we don't feel that. Sometimes we forget our age. Like if there's nobody looking at us and there's no mirror around and like, for instance, when I'm, I'm with a bunch of 20 year olds at school or whatever, I, I temporarily forget that I'm not a 20 year old anymore. So a lot of our participants are, are like that. They come in and, and they have the burden of I'm old, no one's going to hire me and, and all the negative implications of related to ageism. And then we have to undo these things slowly. So there, it's two steps. There's the stuff that we can do or our self perception and also the external factors that uh, have to be taken care of. So our participants are, are for, like, I'm, I'm just telling you this for context, but our participants are 40 and above um, and they are professionals. So what I mean by professionals, it's not, we don't, our, our niche aren't the trades. It's really whether, you know, professional, it could be office work, it could be academia, it could be anything, just not the trades because there are a bunch of other partners of Alpha Quebec that do the trades. Our mission, I'm going to read our mission, because I should know this, but it's all the special. So we provide accessible support for individuals in establishing their careers while adapting to current employment, marketing, and recruitment realities. Actually, that's the mission. What we hope to do is guide you to becoming effective at your job search. And that's, that's what it's all about. It's being effective in your job search. 
Um, and there's a lot of guidance that we want to support you along the process because that's one of the things it's tough. And I'm sugarcoated, but looking for work now is tough. Looking for work as a mature per worker is tough. So what you need is support around you. You don't want to be doing this alone. Um, how do we do this? So our, our services include workshops. We have two workshops. Uh, well, they're bilingual. So we have two in English, two in French. Uh, per week, sometimes we have special guests come in, do complimentary workshops, like off the wall is more exciting. Um, we have one that in incorporated improv techniques into job search. It happens to be our, our favorite workshop and everybody enjoys it, but it's all about being able to seize the moment. Because again, everything seems to, tends to be linear and technical, but looking for work is, is not a linear process. And I'll get into that a little later. Um, we also have something called storytelling. And, and the reason we called it storytelling, and it's, it's once a week and there's a theme, it's because the strategy is in an interview, it's all about storytelling. It's like every time they ask you a question, you're telling a story, an anecdote about you. For instance, you know, um, do you have, it's never going to be that simple, but you know, tell us about your leadership skills or are you a good leader or something like that. And instead of answering yes or, or your canned answers that every internet uh, guru tells you to do, tell me your story. Give a story that demonstrates your leadership skills. The, the, the more intense, the better. So like if you had bigger hurdles and the beautiful thing about that is that recruiters tend to hear the same answers over and over, but your story is unique. So no one's heard this before. So that's the exciting part of it. Like you keep, you keep the recruiter on board and listening to you. And it's also, you don't get bored of it because you're telling different stories and you have multiple stories. So, so that's kind of how it works. In our coaching sessions, we have coaching sessions. So we assign a coach to you. We try to match the personality. And uh, you meet about once a week, let's say ish, for, for one hour. It can change sometimes front ended a bit depending on your requirements. So in a nutshell, that is La Pasca. Ding. There you go. Okay. Looking for work challenges for the mature job seeker. Okay, so the recruitment the recruitment process, most of you know. I don't have to tell you this, but it's it's flawed. I hope there are there any recruiters in the room. Just before I go on about it, I'm gonna okay. I'm not hearing anything. So look, let's let's go with that. And it's not the recruiters that are bad. It's just the process isn't meant to be effective. It's meant to be efficient. So the more, it's, it's like uh, the, the objective is to go through as many applications as possible because there is an overwhelming number of applications now as opposed to the, when we were younger, as opposed to when we used to have to type our applications and it took forever to type it. So yeah, it's, it's harder to, it, fewer people applied back then, um, but it's not effective. It doesn't, there's no guarantee that it's gonna find the best person. So if you apply and you don't get selected, you don't get hired, it, that's not because you weren't the best candidate. It's just for lack of better processes, you weren't selected. And there's stuff you can do about that as well. Um, job postings, too long. Again, I could say this to this group, but you know, remember when we, when we were young and then you would go to the Gazette or the Star and then you would look at a job description, which was like about this big, and it had a few needs and, and a lot more likes and uh, good to haves. Now you see a job posting, two, three pages. It includes everything under the kitchen sink for a nominal salary most of the time. And, and that's slightly discouraging because you look at all this and most people say, I don't have all of this. I don't have, anyways, I used to work with a recruiter and she'd say, if you have half of the things, apply anyway, because they're asking for the moon. Chances are that person doesn't exist. So there, there's that um, flaws, flaws. 70 to 80% of the jobs out there are never posted, which is significant. Because if you think about it and you do what they tell you to do, apply online, go apply online. What you're doing is, is you're in a, in a small segment of 20 to 30% of the jobs that you are, you are, you're competing with almost everybody. So everybody goes to that 20, 30%. And so, you know, if your, if your resume doesn't get selected, well, it's, it's, it's just, a, it's a numbers thing. There's too many numbers. And so we have to find alternatives to the standard recruitment process. Um, 
interviews we saw, we talked about interviews not not the most effective things sometimes they tend to be a little bit cruel and dehumanizing and we see that in our workshop you see like when people come to la pasta they're pretty much at zero on the self esteem and that has a lot to do with the whole recruitment process and interviews as well um, lack of feedback um, that's that's one of the major problems we don't get any feedback so you apply and nothing I mean, it used to be a time where if you applied, you'd get a, a little note or a letter saying, thank you for your application, unfortunately, blah, blah, blah. Um, actually, in one of the workshops last month, somebody told us that, well, it's not last month, I just made that part up, it was a four months ago. But the person um, uh, in the workshop said that, look, I, I just got to, because we asked him how it's going with the, with the job application, he was talking, he goes, I got a rejection letter. And everybody started to applaud. It's like, wow. You got a rejection letter. That's fantastic. Congratulations. To the point where you, you know, sadly, that's that's the way it is. But this this thing about you apply. So you apply a couple of times and then you don't get the job, you didn't get any feedback, and you say, well, maybe it's because I'm too old. Or or maybe it's because I'm obsolete or or whatever. But it's just a little thought and it passes. You apply a few more times, the thought gets a little bit more entrenched, you get a little bit more, well, yeah, maybe it is because I'm too old. Again, a few more applications, it's like, I knew it, I'm too old. Then you start applying for jobs you're overqualified for. So you apply for like, you know, something I used to do like 10 years ago, I should get this job. But you know, that's red flags for the recruiter because they, they just figure you're, you know, you're um, gonna be there until you find something better. So then as far as you're concerned, you never got a call back for something you were able to do and you're overqualified for. So that just solidifies. And this is just a negative spiral going down and to the point where you become um, ineffective. You can't even look for work anymore. Like, what's the point? What's the point looking for work? And even if I do get an interview, I probably don't have what it takes anyway. So how are you supposed to move forward when you're dealing with this kind of self-esteem and self-confidence issues? Um, it would be nice to get some feedback. Um, dealing with loss of self-esteem. Again, um, I won't get too, too much into it because I'm going to run out of time, but the self-esteem, self-confidence thing, that disappears. I've seen, I've seen professionals that have been, you know, stellar careers, VPs, 20, 25 years, and then three months without a job and they're at zero. And it, it, just, it, it tanks, it tanks really, really fast. And then again, without self-confidence, how are you going to apply for jobs that are a little bit out of your reach that you should be going for. Um, you don't even bother applying for jobs. Your whole body language changes. Your back shifts down a bit, your eyes gaze down, your, 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 your sentences are affirmative and strong. And, and you can't go into an interview with a lack of self-confidence because you always answer questions with a little bit of an uptick. Like uh, you answer questions with a little bit of doubt. Like, you know, uh, tell me about, uh, are you a good leader? Yeah, and, and that's how it comes out. It's, it's not strong. So recruiters are very good at picking up on that. Um, not giving up, super tough. Um, again, by the time most of our participants come, well, there are two types. There's the proactive ones that are they're like, I'm gonna get fired tomorrow. I'm gonna get laid off yesterday, whatever. There's also the other kind where they wait. They, they, I'm going to exhaust all my opportunities. Um, the last thing I want to do is go somewhere and ask them to help me, especially like an employment service provider, blah, blah, blah. Um, so then they wait a bit too long. It, it's amazing how quickly your RRSP can dissolve. Um, so then you find yourself I'm with the money and I have a self-confidence. It's been a year. Um, and then you gotta you gotta deal with job search with all these things on your thing. So so giving up becomes a little bit easier. So the thing is, don't give up. Um, and there are ways not to give up. Ding. I, I wish I had a real bell. Okay. So look at work strategies. Don't go at it alone. That's my number one suggestion. Um, don't do this alone. There are a ton of us. There are many employment service providers out there that are offering subsidized, subsidized um, employment counseling. Do, take, care, take advantage of it, it's there. Um, going it alone, I've had so many people say, well, no, I don't have the time or, or I don't need the help or whatever. And then, or you listen to interviews where they say, I've been job hunting for a year. Well, if you've been job hunting for a year um, and I'm not making a judgment because if, if you've been doing it alone, you're going with that negative cycle and you don't become effective anymore. 
um, join a group, join somebody, just don't go at it alone. It's difficult. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do professionally is finding work. Um, know yourself. It sounds a bit hokey, but if you go into an interview and one of the questions they're gonna ask you is why should we hire you? You have to know. It's your job to know why they should hire you. So that means getting intimate with that job description. That means going through your professional history, finding out what matches, understand your personality type, understand your abilities, understand your knowledge and experience and how it fits into this. So there's work to be done. It's not just doing a resume. That's why it's good to have somebody helping you. It's like, it's about, okay, when I come to the interview, I have to know the package that is me. And, and while you're doing it, you're gaining all sorts of self-confidence. For instance, you know, you go through your resume, you go through your professional experience and you're there, well, um, yeah, these were my successes. These were my failures that I learned from, reframing failures. And each time you do that, you think back, okay, yeah, you know what? Because we tend to forget about our, the good things we've done. We tend to focus on the negative. So, especially in the recruitment process. So you do that. Um, rethinking your job search process. You know, when I mentioned that 70, uh, 70, 80% of jobs are filled before you ever apply, before they're ever posted, um, that means you need a new strategy. So find one that combines applying online, which isn't the most effective way, with, with something else. And, and that could be becoming more proactive. Like in the next one, creating opportunities, becoming more proactive. Um, Apply online, that's fine, but do something more. Go, go make, do information sessions. Try to talk to people in the organization. Get a sense of what it's really like in there. Um, a, it answers your questions, and B, it makes you um, look very prepared. So when you go and they ask you questions, you can say things like, like you know, everybody, so why do you want to work here? Well, I've talked to a few people that actually work here, and and this is what they told me, and these happen to be four or five of my core values, or these are the things that I need to get motivated or whatever. But that is so much more powerful than, you know, I went on your website and I see that you're very active in the community, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's a more powerful thing to do. Um, becoming more proactive, I said, um, be more proactive. It, it's, and I don't like to use the word networking because it turns a lot of people off and it's like a, a dirty manipulative thing, but we call it creating opportunities. It's like seizing a moment, talking to people, um, because the recruitment process is very linear. And it's very easy. I can say, well, it's easy. It's not easy, but I can say, look, I, I applied to 10 jobs, so I should be getting um, a few callbacks for an interview. Once I have an interview, then I should have a second interview. And after a second interview, maybe. So it's a very linear process. So people feel like they've accomplished a lot. I applied to 10 jobs last week. But sometimes just talking to people creates opportunities. And it doesn't seem like you've done anything like, so I've talked to five people this week, big deal. But you don't know. You don't know what these events trigger. Like, you know, a conversation you have with somebody can come back three weeks later and then, oh, you know, I, I met somebody and they're talking about looking for. So you have to get the word out, first of all, that you're looking for work. And, and so the more people know, the more opportunities you're going to have. Small, small um, warning, never ask anybody for a job. I suppose you all know that, but it's just, it, it's just like it's taking the burden off my shoulders and it's putting it on yours like, hey, Katya, great meeting you. I haven't seen you in ages. Hey, do, do you know of a job for me? And then it's just like, it's just like, no. And I, I stress you with that. So I'm never asking you for a job, although it's understood. What I'm really asking you is for guidance in my job search process. So I'm asking for information to help guide me. Everybody has information, or if you don't have information, it's easy to say, sorry, I don't. But like what I'm really want, looking for is information to help guide me in my job search. It's subtle, but it makes a world of difference. All right, we're kind of okay on time. Ding. You know, once I get going, this I could finish maybe two, three in the afternoon, so someone's going to have to stop me. Um, hiring mature workers, the benefits. Obviously, workforce diversity. I mean, it, it, the ideal thing is to have is to have diversity in the workforce, and uh, today, diversity and inclusiveness is such a such a, a huge thing. And I find it interesting that ageism is not part of this discussion. 
you know, we have to hire this or we need to do, be aware of this, sensitized to this, but ageism continues in the workforce and it's, and it's very detrimental for, for many reasons, but um, the diversity aspect is great. And I talk about it a little bit later as well. Well, actually down the last item, mentoring and coaching. Um, I've seen organizations that have adopted this multi-general, multi-generational uh, mentoring um, process where, well, it's not even a process, it's just a thing that happens and it's, and it's promoted by the environment and the culture, but it's not just mature workers telling the younger workers what to do and how to do it, it's vice versa, it's both. It's like both are learning off of each other and that creates cohesiveness and then we get the strengths of both. Um, also for diversity, there's just some things that mature workers are and mature, you know, 45 and above are better at than the youth and vice versa. So like, you're not going to hire me to be a software developer. I spent the first 20 years of my career in software development, but I can pretty much guarantee you no one's going to hire me anymore for, it's just that much more complicated the technical stuff. But in software development, um, so many things haven't changed. The whole people aspect, the whole management, the whole leadership, that hasn't changed. What happens when a client is frustrated or when you're behind schedule? These things are, you know, it's, it's, it's the same as when I was doing it. So, you know, there's that experience that I bring to it. So that's what my advantage would be is the experience. Uh, mature workers tend to be a little bit better at, at problem solving. I'm generalizing. This is almost stereotyping mature workers, but also um, uh, customer service. So these are, tend to be little niches that we're still a little bit better at generally speaking. Um, I mentioned different set of skills that we talked about, professional wisdom. Um, that, those are little things. Like I remember um, one of my bosses when I was young told me like, let's never bring an issue to a status meeting. It's just a political hotbed and you're gonna get yourself in trouble. If you're late or there's an issue you wanna bring up, bring them to breakfast, talk about it. So by the time it gets to the, the status meeting, it's been resolved. It's just an item on an agenda. It's not an opportunity to, for, for all sorts of problems. You know, I bring that to the table. It's like, you know, at 20, I did not realize this. Now I realize it. So, and that's just one example. All of us, I'm sure all of you have examples of things that I've learned the hard way. I, I know bringing an issue to, to a status meeting was a hard thing for me to learn because I really did get in trouble for that, but I don't do that anymore. And mentoring and coaching. Yes. And then, it's something that, that like I, I mentioned, it's, it's multi-generational. Ideally, you want to have companies doing the same thing. There was a, an organization that, um, that I went to visit, uh, M1 Composites, and, and um, there was um, the president was, was showing me the floor, and then he showed me two people, a, a younger person and an older person. He goes, look, these guys are exchanging ideas. And it's, and it's a discussion that they're having and they're both bringing their experiences and their, and their, and their technical abilities into, the, into that discussion. And he says, there's no stress and it's just ideal and how much more um, well, efficient, well, how much stronger they are at performing and, and how they are at reaching their goals. So he's super happy about bringing older people in. All right, so um, Dean. This is cool because I have no idea what the next one is. Are we changing it? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. That's a, that's a new slide. The benefits? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? Uh, it sounds yeah. like I just did it. Okay, go go to the one after. Sorry about that. No, we're good. Wait, hold on. Okay. So the effects of ageism on the work on the workforce, or the, just overall. So on the mature worker, here I, I I wrote down a bunch of things that are I see in our participants. So I, most obvious is discouragement. So, so a lot of our participants come discouraged, like no one's going to hire me, I'm too old. And imagine you're 55 or 50 or even 60s and, and you're there, I'm too old, nobody wants me. It's like, well, oh, wait a minute, you've got a lot of years left in you. 
and you've got a lot to offer. So to say that nobody wants me at 55 is, or 60, 65 is just, just not right. So we have to counter that. Loss of self-esteem, self-confidence, we talked about that. Um, we have a negative, so an unrealistic negative self-perception. And, and that's one of the reasons I say you should join, join an organization that will help you because that just gets more and more entrenched. What you need is some, to, to relook at, to, to re, reframe your self-perception and not the focus on I'm too old, but focus on what I have to bring to the equation. Get, get rid of the old part. Um, obviously, inability to find meaningful work. I mean, in, 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 in simplistic terms, like, well, no one's going to hire me to do what I'm really good at. I'm just going to try to get a job doing whatever. So that leads to, to underemployment and, and underutilization of, of skills and talent. Loss of sense of purpose. Um, obviously, like a lot of us put our, our sense of purpose in our jobs, um, which is not the right thing, but you take your job away, you have loss of sense of purpose. What, what, what am I contributing here? Um, depression. You know, there are all sorts of cases where this leads to depression and, and try to find a job when you're depressed. And we have a lot of participants who, who have to overcome this depression. And that's sometimes beyond what we can do, but we can start the process. Um, and health, obviously, obviously these things are going to have a play a toll. Like if you're not sleeping well, um, you tend to get sicker, you're more vulnerable. Um, so all of these things, the effects of ages of not being able to find work, not because you're not good, because of preconceived notions out there, but on the family, um, older men, I mean, I'm generalizing again, but what I noticed our participants, older men, I mean, when we were brought up, it's like, you're the family provider. I'm not saying that's the way it should be, but a lot of older men were brought up thinking that they are the family provider. And if they lose the job, it's they're losing their, what their number one function is. These are, this is the older gen generation. Um, for women, for the family, and uh, most, again, I'm generalizing, but a lot of women have the dual role of taking care of their parents or, or the in-laws and the kids. So there's, they're taking care of this and fighting a career at the same time and then looking for work. And we have several participants that are trying to find work, juggling this with the parents and the kids and just dealing with them, I'm too old. Um, um, financial incertitude, mortgage, uh, you know, how am I going to pay the mortgage? And then that affects the family. You know, that, that puts a stress on the family. Divorce, it leads to divorce as well. So these are all the effects of, you know, of, of not being able to find work, but a lot of to do with ageism because it's our age group. And on society, obviously, like, you know, there's, there's a labor shortage going on. And it's, and it's not just a pandemic labor shortage. It's, it's also related to demographics and it's been a while now and people know that there are not enough people coming onto the workforce, whether it's through immigration or, or just you know, the youth getting older, there's not enough to, to replace the people that are leaving. And that's just demographics. So, so um, shutting out a large segment, a, a very performant segment of your workforce is not an ideal situation for, for a country. I mean, where countries are going to be competing for, for labor, you, you don't want to be shutting it out, not to mention just gross national product, et cetera, et cetera. Um, increase in healthcare costs, the sicker the population, obviously, the more healthcare costs it's going to incur. And um, again, I don't have numbers on this, but I know a lot of people are on antidepressants to, to deal with the situation. Um, you know, and if I, you can tell some of our participants that they're not 100% because they're being calmed down. So it, it's having a negative effect on, on, on the capacity for our workforce to perform. All right. So not done yet, almost. We're almost there. I'll transition to the next one. Um, as I was having a conversation and I mentioned to somebody that I, I feel like La Passerelle how many of you know MASH, the TV show? I'm going to use a small parallel. So MASH, I feel like we're a MASH unit. So we'll, we'll, we'll get our participants and then, you know, we buff them up and build up the self-confidence and um, get them ready to go back into the workforce. But, um, you know, we're still sending them out. I mean, we're super happy when they find jobs and there are a lot of companies 
and organizations that take good care of their participants, but there's still many that don't. So we're sending them back out into what they what drove them to us in the first place. So, you know, La Passerelle and our fellow employment service providers, we're good at what we do. We can, we can take people, bring them and put them back in the workforce with a little bit more self-confidence and, and, and being a little bit more positive. But what we don't do is we don't fix the problem. We, we work on the symptoms, but we don't fix the problem. So, you know, there are other organizations that do that. And um, I'd like to introduce SIDEC now as one of these organizations. Um, they, this is fun because when I do my workshop, I'm going to go ding, but there won't be anybody at the other end to, to flip the slides. Um, so SIDEC, I was, I was introduced to, I'm going to go a little bit all over the place, but I was introduced to SIDEC as a, as a member of the Mature Worker Initiative. Mature Workers Initiative. So all of a sudden I found myself around a table of people. Um, some of them you can almost say are, are competitors, like they're fellow service and employment. But, you know, and then there are people from the private sector, there are people from other um, community organizations. Um, and I found that we were all very, um, we worked together very well. And that's the environment that CIDEC created. They created an environment where we were moving forward on, on um, all sorts of initiatives together. So I'll just read a couple of things from Mature Workers Initiative, just to give you a little bit of perspective. So the objectives were to ensure that community organizations, employment service providers, program developers, policymakers um, have a better understanding of the needs and challenges of the English speaking mature workers in Quebec. Um, also increase awareness among businesses and, rec and recruitment agencies about the benefits of hiring mature workers and increase the awareness and access to employment or employability related services to the resources. So these were, these were like three corner stone um, objectives of, of the mature workers initiative. And I know they took it, they took it far. They went, they went all the way to creating awareness in the community. They had a conference, um, was a, a social media um, campaign, awareness campaign. Um, they were on, they produced a few reports or multiple um, news segments, and it's, it's not an easy slog. Yeah, you have to go out there and, and, and promote the obvious. And so there's more than just saying, hey, you know, you should hire mature workers. You have to go through the process, um, talk to companies, highlight, highlight what's going on. So that was, that was how I was introduced to the to SEDEC. And I was, I was really impressed by that organization um, to the point now where well, I'm, I'm a member of the board and I'm very proud of it. I have two, two members of SEDEC here watching me who are going to hopefully not be tough on me because they would be infinitely better at presenting SEDEC than, than I might be. So like a quick introduction to SEDEC. Basically, SEDEC, Community Economic Development and Employability Corporation, helps communities achieve economic success, taking economic development initiatives um, to action to sustainable results. Um, they produce tangible economic benefits for people and communities by leveraging community assets, opportunities to create viable, sustainable ventures. Um, uh, how they do that, like connecting people to jobs, generating new jobs, upskilling workers, building and expanding businesses, creating new products and services, attract investment, expand trade, increase uh, tax revenues. And they're actively involved in like 10 regions. So like there's a greater Montreal, Eastern Townships, Outaouais, that's around us, there are nor Lower North Shore, Lower Saint Laurent, Abitibi, Etienne-Escaming, Gaspésie, et la Madeleine, Southwest Quebec and Quebec. So they're all throughout Quebec. Um, yeah, basically that's 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 the introduction to CIDEC. Um, it's going through my notes. All right, so um, a little bit of context that we were that I can bring to same. So CIDEC also does a lot of work on on generating reports. So it's not just looking at data and providing us with data. It's, it's assimilating and putting context to the data. And providing reports to help us move forward. Um, you know, mature workers and labor force context firms 
adapting their management practices to cope with an aging population and workforce. So, um, you know, we're stressing diversity hiring. Um, there's not enough of it going on and, and you need to be changing it. And there's no choice. There's really no choice. You have to start looking at diversification to hire mature workers just because you won't have enough workers. And that includes automation as well. Um, yeah, automation will take some jobs away, but not all, and then you still won't have enough people. Um, the CIDIC has all sorts of examples of organizations that are showing initiatives that encourage mature workers to remain in the workforce. Like, for example, they have CIDEXO, where they have a program for that helps 50 and above, um, which mature workers that are 50 and above find um, ease into retirement. So whether it's reducing the days at work, reducing responsibilities, but maintaining them in the workforce instead of letting them go, they maintain them in the workforce, they keep the knowledge. Um, it's, it's actually a, a, a benefit to, to, um, to, to keeping people on board. Um, so they do that. Um, there's also multi-generational um, mentoring that they do. And I mentioned M1 as an, M1 as an example as well. Um, so well, Leslie, I, you're, yeah. you're coming a little bit close to the, well, you're, you're over your time. I don't know how no many way. more slides you have left or. I have 1043. Not, yeah, I have on the agenda that you were going until 1040 and then we were going to do questions, but right. so, I have so, only got one question so far. So. Unless there's a lot of questions, you can continue on. I'm I'm happy to hear more about CIDEC. Yeah. Okay. I'll 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 finish up with CIDEC saying like um, there's there's an initiative a few years ago on the board we put together a strategy and and CIDEC's new strategy deals with bringing the public, private, and civil society sectors together. It, it was a bold initiative. Not many people have done it, but um, the the benefits here is that you're bringing three people together. And I think one of the things that I remember most from, from our, all our strategy sessions is when somebody mentioned that we need more pie. Like the government's great at cutting up pie, but we need more pie to cut up. And by getting the private sector involved with, with these initiatives, so you have government, you have the private sector, and you have civil society ourselves working together, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recipe for success. So CEDEC is, the first that I know to, to implement this. And you're taking it from theory to implementation. Quick example, there was a project in, in Sutton where they, they brought um, academia together with government and private sector, the Sutton Ski Hill, to provide uh, training for, for their workforce, the seasonal workforce, so that they could work um, more, more during well other seasons as well, so they could do more, and it was a huge success. There's a video on it. I would say, if you're interested, go to the CEDEC website www.cedec.ca and go check out the Sutton video. It's uh, it's moving, and it shows a good example. It gives you a good example of 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 the strategy that CEDEC has adopted and the things that CEDEC can do. And that's just one example, but it's doing that throughout throughout the Quebec region. Um, ding, 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 ding. Okay, um, we're going to talk about Kiji Agency. Uh, Megan's going to come by and talk about it. I'm just super happy because we partnered with the Kiji and it's a, it's a beautiful partnership. So it's going to be a great presentation she's going to do. Yes, Montreal, I wanted to bring Youth Employment Services. I wanted to make a mention out of just because they have a mentoring program for 45, and above, not a mentoring, an entrepreneurship program for 40 and above. So if you're interested in entrepreneurship, you want to try it out and you're over the 40, you don't fit into the youth, um, the SAGE or the other programs for younger entrepreneurs, there's, there's that YES program. Ding, 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 ding. And Emploi Quebec, um, it's our number one, it's our primary funder, but beyond that, well, it's called Service Quebec now, but they offer all sorts of tools that you can use. Go to the website, they can, you know, they have labor market information. So anything you want to know about a job, if you're transitioning into accounting or whatever, they're there. Um, if the information's there. They can tell you, you know, if a job, uh, for, if an industry looks positive, the kind of training you need. Um, they have job boards. You can s set up your profile so that employers who have access to the job boards for free, by the way, which is great for small, medium-sized businesses, 
it, the system will link your resume up or your profile up with the job demands and you can see what's available. Um, and and they, they, there's a list of all the employment service providers there. So you can say uh, mature workers or age 45 and above, it'll list you all the employment service providers by, by segment as well. And, um, and if you want to call them, give them a call, talk to an agent and, and they can help you, they can guide you because there's all sorts of employee Quebec programs out there now to help the um, unemployed job seeker and mature workers. And I think that's it. Thank you. Oh yeah, no, I don't, uh, yeah, discover La Passerelle, come to our website. I guess this is, <laughs> I'm getting paid to say this one. So La Passerelle, www.lapasserelle.ca, you can call us 866-5982. We're super happy to talk to you. Um, again, come see us, we'd love you to see us, but you, any one of our partners, any one of our uh, fellow employment survivor, provider, providers, just don't go at, at it alone. And thank you. Thank you. So I have a couple questions that came through here. One you can see, and then a few others that I don't think you can. I think they came to me directly. Um, well, the first one you can read, but I think this is an interesting one. Uh, and this is the idea of how volunteering can evolve into a possible employment opportunity or build confidence for people who are looking for work. I'm glad you asked that because I didn't put that in my slide. Volunteering, super important um, in the sense that A, on your resume, it plugs a hole. But more than that, beyond that, it does build self-confidence. You, you're, you're doing something. You're feeling useful again. Um, you're making network connections. You're talking to people, you know, and the whole body language. I volunteered a lot when I was, I was, I was a participant at La Pascal and I volunteered a lot. And the, the thing there, the warning is that you, you tend to volunteer more than you should because then you're volunteering, you're getting all this positive stuff out of it and you're not job hunting. So just be careful with that. Set a time limit. I'm going to give two days a week to you guys, but it's a very positive thing. Yeah, I, I think that's a great suggestion too, because you're right. You get so many great things and you're having so much fun. Um, sure. <laughs> uh, so someone is asking whether or not there's an equivalent organization like La Passerelle for mature workers living in Quebec City who can provide services in English. Oh, I don't know. I'd love to know. I'm sure I'm sure there's services that are. are I'm sure there must be. Um, again, go to the Emploi Quebec website and, and there, there there's a section where it says employment service providers. And then you can you can find out. There's also the uh, community group that serve English people um, of the Quebec City region. I think it's called Voice of Quebec, but I'll find that when Megan gives her presentation and I'll put it up into the chat box because they may have a connection with someone or who can help you. Um, OK, couple more questions. Sorry, just quickly. I mean, if there's none, which I doubt, I'm, I'm sure there is. I mean, we're, we're, we're limited in our, in our ability to um, offer services outside the region, Montreal region, but not physically anymore. Like we can, we can, doesn't matter where you are now. It's just, we can't bring you into the program. However, um, on a one-by-one -one basis, we, could, we can adopt, adapt you into our workshops. The workshops, like there's room in the workshops. So, if, you know, for the occasional person that's looking for English services in Quebec City, if you can't find them, you can come to us. And you could also reach out to SEDEC as well. Okay. I'm just trying to question. score points with John here in case I didn't <laughs> on my presentation. You know you're being watched. Um, okay, so what are some of the skills that you would consider excellent, important, transferable skills for mature workers? Oh, good one. I mean, A lot of the skills that are transferable are useful. The hardest thing is to figure out what your transferable skills are. Um, as mature workers, what we bring to the equation tends to be, like I mentioned earlier, um, and I don't want to generalize, but it is a bit generalizing problem solving. Like we tend to be, we tend to be a little bit more creative. It's more more experience at problem solving, so that could be one of the things. Obviously, the mentoring role, the wisdom that we bring into it, and um, dealing with people, 
the interaction and like that's huge. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, when I when I was taking a, the program at La Passe, they were telling us, and many people tell us, whatever you did before the year 2000 or 2010 now, forget it. It's not meaningful. Don't even put it on your resume. And we're like, well, wait a minute. I have accumulated, let's say, 10, 15 years of experience. Technologically, maybe, yeah, I'm, I'm outdated, but I still have accumulated like 15, 20 years of experience dealing with people, dealing with problems. And these, these haven't changed. So you want to bank on the fact that, look, I'm bringing all of these into, into the play. I would even say also, and this is just from my personal experience, that older people are, are way better at dealing with crisis. They just don't get freaked out the same way because they've seen it all. So like if you have someone who's 30 and you're in an environment or you're, you're hosting an event and your audio is not working, they haven't had this happen to them 12 times where they're like, okay, you got to go find the sound engineer. You got to plug in. You got it. Like there's just a certain level of confidence and lack of panic that I really appreciate yeah, yeah. that when things go badly or something goes wrong, you can count on people who have been around and have seen this kind of thing before. Um, so here's another I, one. I, Many I, I was sorry. I was born during the Cuban missile crisis. So I'm, I'm assuming I'm not the only one. Like the world almost ended the, the year I was born. So after that, it's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, okay, so many mature workers, usually not professionals, face a steep learning curve when it comes to basic communication technology. What kind of services are available to help support them? Oof, communication's huge. Um, are we talking... Are we talking, I don't know, social media? Are we talking, um, yeah. Probably that whole, like the integration of the internet and social media that has really boomed in the last 10 years, whereas before it wasn't as necessary as I would say it is now. Yeah, sorry, so the question was? I are there services available yeah, to help yeah, other yeah. people with that? Um, I, yes, yes, there are services out there. There are. There are organizations that 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 have a program with Emploi Quebec that um, focus more on that aspect. I mean, job skills. So there's educational institutions that are offering all sorts of programs to, to help you with that. And Emploi Quebec has several that are, are subsidized. So it's with local CGEPs and, and they're subsidized as well. Okay, so again, that would be available would, in English. People could find that possibly in English. Okay. There are, there are English services available, yeah. Again, uh, this is a good one. Um, and I think everyone can possibly relate, but how, how would someone, or how do you recommend someone deal with being passed over for a promotion if they suspect it's due to their age? That's a good one. Usually, usually they were more than passed over. They were left to go by the time they get to us. So we don't have a lot of participants that have been passed on. Um, you know, I don't have a set answer for that one. Um, the closest I could come would be in, let's say in the job interview, if they, if age is brought up, um, then, then you have to, you have to get around that, like, excuse me. Um, but if you're in a issue. role, like let's say you're working somewhere and you're pretty sure that you have, that someone has been hired ahead of you and you're quite sure it's because of your age what would you recommend like could people i mean the same way that you know there's um quebec services to help guide you if you feel i mean could you call service emploi if you think that you're being i mean basically persecuted because of your age yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go to my default answer for these things is it depends and and i and i'm not brushing off the answer it's just it really depends on the situation who your employer is your status you, you know how you stand financially um how important the job is um but yeah you made a good point seek legal advice as well um as to as to your rights um if you know there's the office i know commission it's not office commission they know the travail you can you could go on their website you could ask them for information um, again, it, it depends. Like, you know, how, how how much of how much how many waves do I want to make on this one? Am I just going to pass it on and keep my job? Commission des droits de la personne. Thank you. I guess I had the older one. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's, you're right. You have it's to sort a of... tough. It's a tough call on, on, on how to deal with that. The relationship you have with your, with your boss. Yeah. So one more question and then we're going to go and let everyone stretch their legs and pour a cup of coffee. It will be my fourth of the day and I'm doing it anyways. This is an interesting one. And uh, I, I'm sure particularly with your organization, La Passerelle, well, probably SEDEC as well, but language confidence is a particular issue in Quebec. Can you speak to how you see this impacting people? Um, lots of points there. So language confidence. So people will come and they'll say, well, you know, in Quebec, you have to post that you know, the job is, you have to speak French. It's just it's a requirement. You can't post a job saying that it's English only. Um, so a lot of jobs are preconceived to be, you know, French only, but not really. Sometimes they're bilingual. So, or participants sometimes won't apply to a job just because they believe that, you know, you have to speak French. Um, another thing is we under underestimate what our French, how strong our French is. That's somebody calling me to tell me to shut up. Is, is that it? Was that it? Was that one of you? Um, it's, um, yeah, so we underestimate how good our French is. So yeah, maybe um, I, I, could, I could understand French, I could speak French, but maybe not as well as I, um, I think I should. And sometimes that, that's not, you know, we set our own barriers. And, and sometimes when our participants come to me and say, look, I, I, my French isn't good enough, I'll say, well, you know, there was a time when French speaking or, or, or people taking uh, French courses or to teach French um, failed their French exams. So it's all relative. Like, you know, even French Canadians, they can be like, well, the French isn't that great all the time. So um, don't, don't let it be a barrier. Apply anyway. We've had so many uh, um, uh, English speaking Quebecers that find jobs. Well, most of our English speaking Quebecers find jobs, um, regardless of whether it's a francophone environment or not. And again, it's not just language, it's culture. Yeah. And, and I think you're right about that lack of confidence really seeps into language. And, you know, you can have spoken French your whole life, but you think, well, personally, like my writing skills are not great. But unless I'm applying to be a journalist or an editor, or, you know, as long as I can write emails and people know what I'm talking about, if that's yeah. my biggest barrier. Most people are willing to either work with you, um, help you improve it, or, you know, often an employer I've seen, if they find the right candidate who has a few weak spots, they will, you know, work with what they get. Especially anyway. in a labor shortage situa situation. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to let everyone uh, go have a cup of tea and stretch their legs. I have to say this because I think it's really cute and I won't say who it is, but somebody just sent me a direct message in capital letters saying this guy is the best. So, <laughs> which I think is the checks in the mail. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. I'll give you, we'll come back in 10 minutes. Um, so go make your cup of tea. Leslie will not be playing the accordion, sadly, but you know, maybe for the next webinar. Next one. Invite me back and I'll, I'll practice. Okay. Thank you. See you all in 10 minutes. Oh, there we go. We're being recorded again. <laughs> Same rules stand. If you don't mind staying on mute, that would be really helpful. If you don't want to be seen on the recording, feel free to turn your camera off. Um, if you want to leave your camera on, try not to be overly distracting. I'm looking at you, Leslie. So <laughs> we're going to take a moment and introduce Megan. Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've heard great things about the Kiji Agency. So I'm just going to read a little bit of her bio to introduce her to those of you who don't know her. And then Megan's going to talk to us about what she does, what her agency does, um, and why she started doing what she does. So Megan um, started as a, well, her goal was to have a career as an international business one, woman, obtaining a degree in international business, picturing a jet setting career. She traveled around Europe while obtaining 
a couple of law degrees before moving back to Canada for another law degree certification as a Canadian risk manager. She worked in technology sector for 10 years before deciding to open her own not-for-profit agency, the Kiji Agency, a province-wide online platform where people 55 years and older can find part-time, occasional, volunteer, or short-term work across Quebec. Ms. Marinos continues to work as a consultant for other startup businesses and she volunteers. So Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously the issue of employment in older adults is something very close to your heart. So I really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, are you able to hear me? Cause I'm hearing an echo for myself. Yes, okay. So why don't we uh, jump right in and uh, put up the presentation because it will explain quite a bit. So I'm gonna minimize my view of everyone else. Wonderful, excellent. So thank you, Vanessa, for the introduction. And yes, I did have that dream of flying on airplanes for work for a long time. And um, it, it happened by at least flying on a few airplanes to get around and, and travel the country, the different countries before coming back home. Um, and as Vanessa pointed out, uh, starting my own nonprofits because um, older adults are very dear to my heart. Um, because I suppose I was raised to have a profound respect uh, for people who are older than myself. And this turned into a little bit of um, a love for being around people who are much older than I am. And Kiji Agency uh, was probably born not only because of a few things I'm gonna share with you today, but uh, because of my mother who right now is 82. And uh, she's still going strong. If it weren't for COVID, she'd still be out there volunteering. Uh, she still does a lot of that. And uh, it's because of her uh, pushing me to be able to talk to other people and to learn as much as I can from anyone who's older than me uh, that this came about. So why don't we go right into what is Kiji Agency by going to the first slide. So it is a nonprofit, but it's, it's two things really. It's a nonprofit for people who are 55 and older with really a goal of helping this particular group stay active, uh, stay healthy, both mentally and physically and socially engaged with others. And we'd like to do this through occasional work. The other side of it is really for the business side. So it is a staffing solution uh, for a wide variety of businesses. There are very few businesses uh, Kiji will, will not really seek. And this is primarily in the healthcare area. And really it's due to COVID um, that we've pulled back from looking into the healthcare sector. But any business that's looking to fill a short-term mandate, it could be, for example, at the end of the month, uh, some businesses have a, a little bit of a pressing time. It could be because there's a big project. Uh, they could be looking for their full-time staff member and therefore they need someone to cover a, a short period. Some businesses uh, have volunteer needs, so they have particular events such as this one, for example. And if we had been in a conference uh, um, area, then you would need somebody to help set up, maybe take down and things like that. There are quite a few people who in the age range that we're looking at, so 55 and older, who are still looking for full-time employment. And a lot of businesses clearly would love to have full-time staff. It's not our goal to staff uh, in this area. However, we are open uh, to businesses looking for full-time people and of course for uh, older people to, uh, to find full-time work. We move on to the next slide. The why. So aside from, as I mentioned, my personal uh, interest in helping people that are older and learning from them, a couple of pretty basic statistics really, uh, not too long ago, over a third of our population was over 55. And this number is only going to grow. And yes, it's due to the people born between 1946 and 1965. So for the next 20 years, we're gonna see this block of people continue to uh, increase. Um, and this is quite a few people if we're thinking about what the entire population of Quebec is and what this particular generation has, which in my opinion, and it's backed by you know just about anywhere you, you could read today, a group of people who are educated, 
Um, so those in the 50s and 60s likely have either a university de degree or a college degree have completed their uh, secondary five as it is here in Quebec. Um, they're very experienced and this goes beyond just the work experience. This is experience doing a variety of different things. This is experience traveling. Uh, this is experience in just being open to the different types of things that they may read or the different people that they meet. Uh, extremely energetic. I would definitely say just before the pandemic hit, when I was going to the gym in the morning, I would look around and see uh, a lot of people well older than myself uh, on the treadmill next to me. So you have this very vibrant, energetic, very educated group of people that represents a large portion of our population thinking about what the traditional thought of in terms of retirement means, but not really wanting to retire. They still have this experience and this energy and the desire to stay engaged. On the flip side, we also have before the pandemic, um, there was a shortfall uh, if, um, of human resources. We all heard about the fact that there's not enough people to go around, especially out in the regions in terms of work. This still exists, you know, the pandemic kind of shifted the, 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 the concentration on what this meant uh, for a while, but the underlying shortage of personnel to go around uh, to fill some of the positions, it still exists. And now you will be hearing uh, in the news a little bit that it's coming back in terms of the discussion, you know, what it was. You hear, you probably heard even with the elections, uh, a lot of people saying, you know, well, the, the solution is to just ask people to stay longer and not take retirement um, is one that I've heard. But the, the shortage exists pre-pandemic. It exists now for different reasons, even post-pandemic, but it still exists. So there is a, a need to fill this gap. And the last point in terms of the why PG agency is the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, this is, is great. Um, I am fully supportive of DEI, and I'm not sure if there are many people out in the audience today who have been looking at different types of employment offers or employment descriptions, but there has been a sudden increase in the need for a DEI manager or director or somebody to take a particular business to this level and engage with their staff. Um, what I find, however, a lot of people I've spoken with in this particular area is there is a lack of understanding it also encompasses age. And ageism is unfortunately something that still exists. And whilst we do want to concentrate on a lot of the other broader uh, topics that are a little bit more in front of us today, again, which I do fully support Indigenous issues, uh, racial issues, um, LGBTQ issues, age is also an issue that needs to be addressed and I think is part of the DEI uh, equation. So this being said in terms of what KG is and why, uh, I thought the best way to explain how we work and, and what it is that we do is to show you a video. So if we move to the next slide, this should play and you can see how it works.
Thank you for that. We can move to the next slide. Wonderful. So the video was primarily concentrated on the point of view of who we call Kijir, as you saw. So somebody who is 55 and older uh, looking for occasional work. And just to wrap up a little bit, the other side of Kiji Agency in terms of the business side of things, um, what it allows a business to do is sign up uh, and post their job needs and they will have access to their own dashboards to an area where they're able to see everything coming in, uh, manage their job description and receive a, an email notification when there is an applicant to the job that they decided to post. Uh, they will have the ability to interview the individual and hire them as they desire. The way that we will make money in terms of uh, being able to run this service is by charging a fee only to the business, so not the key tier. And our fees are something uh, we would like to say are extremely competitive when we compare ourselves to other types of placement agencies or recruitment agencies because our goal as a nonprofit is really about the key gear. So if a job, if a, sorry, an employer needs help writing a job description or maybe promoting uh, the job via our own uh, social media or our blogs, it's something that we would have the ability to do for them and, and help them in order to find the right person. So the fee structure is based on a, a number of different things, but in the end, it's really low and it's customizable. Our goal is to help connect both the key tier and the business. And just a quick note to say that we are working with quite a few nonprofits and charities, especially in the West Island. Uh, and there is a significant discounts that we would give to uh, nonprofits and charities as well. So we move to the next slide. Okay, so FAQs and FPCs. FAQs, everyone knows, are frequently asked questions, but FPC is my own acronym for frequently proposed comments because those are unsolicited comments uh, that are sometimes funny, but actually very interesting and helpful. I wanted to go through a few of the FAQs in case uh, they are ones that you have. But um, I do get the question of whether or not is this a ploy for paying people less than other people because you know we're older, we're not going to be working full time. And the answer is no. Essentially, any type of job that is being posted is the same pay that the uh, employer would pay anybody else. So it's not to get people to be paid less. Um, it would be the equivalent. And it is something that we verify uh, with the employer. The shifts, um, am I only going to get the, you know, the really bad shifts, like the nights and the weekends? And again, the answer is no. Whilst there are many uh, employers out there, especially a lot of the larger um, ones that have different branches and, and whatnot across the country, they do have um, shifts, shift work. And they do tend to hire the new people to work the nights and weekends. Um, it's not to say we would not allow those types of shifts to be posted, but it's certainly not something that we highlight in terms of wanting an employer to put. This is not uh, an area just to find um, people with nothing else to do in their lives. Um, having met many people doing trade shows over the last couple of years before the pandemic and doing focus groups, uh, there are a lot of people that are 55 and older who have more of a social life than I do, and they are not available uh, nights and weekends. In terms of the type of work you provide, um, as I had mentioned earlier, it's something that is a wide variety of businesses. So not the healthcare industry, not the long-term residence uh, area, but if you think about just about anything else, office environment, outdoors, uh, one type of event, uh, factory, uh, grocery store, um, work from home. So any type of skill um, set that you would have is what we're going to to try to get posted from an employer looking for, to hire. As far as um, the daily life, so you know you you have an appointment, you can't make it to work one day. You have doctor's appointments, you have to take care of a grandchild because your son or daughter uh, called you last minute. 
Well, these are the same things that happen to people that are in their 20s and 30s and 40s. So in my opinion, it is part of life and it is something that would be treated the same way with the employer um, if you were younger or not. So it's not to say that this doesn't happen. It's more a question of just understanding how you manage your communication uh, when these things arrive, arise. And then the last FAQ I often get is, uh, you know, do you guarantee me a job if I sign up? Do you guarantee that I'm going to get something in my field or, or that I'm going to find something? And the answer, again, uh, unfortunately, is no. You know, I'm not going to guarantee that you're going to find a job. Uh, but what I will guarantee is that you will be able to choose uh, from what's there what it is that you want to do. You know, the power really is in the hands of the Kijir to decide if they want to work uh, the shifts that are that are posted, if they want to work at the place that uh, has posted the job. Um, so it's it's all up to you. I think if you just click one more time, we'll pull up our, our FPCs. So these are some of the, uh, the comments I've received, but it's still very helpful to know um, because it could be a bit of a question where people come to me and they say, well, you know, I don't, I don't want this work. I don't want to work uh, in Vaudreuil or I don't want to work at um, Super C. That's okay. Um, you don't have to, to do that. Um, but just understand is those are the jobs that we have at the moment because these are uh, the jobs that are needed. As KG grows um, and finds new employers and, and new agreements with uh, others to post their jobs and to understand the wealth of the experience of people, then we would hope to diversify the job offerings and uh, you'd be able to choose what it is that you'd like to do. Uh, if you don't find anything in your area, uh, again, we are restarting post-pandemic. Uh, we uh, just started actually just right at the start of the pandemic in February 2020. So having had to take a break, uh, we're restarting again. And it just so happens we have a lot of connections in the West Island, uh, but we have a lot of people registered who are all over the province. So at this point, yes, it's true that there's there might not be something in your specific area, uh, but we do send out email communications on a regular basis when there are new jobs being posted so that people are able to see and look at uh, different areas across the region so that we can increase the, the diversification of the employment in the different areas across the province. Uh, the full-time job need, it was our research prior to starting KG to consider a person who was semi-retired or retired not wanting a full-time job because they were retiring and they have a lot of activities. Uh, they want to just, you know, do something now and then get out of the house. But it has come to our attention, I would say, in the last six to eight months the increase in the number of people who are looking for full-time work. And the employers who we're meeting are also posting a lot more uh, full-time work. So even though we are going to stick to um, wanting to promote the part-time or the mandate-based jobs, uh, we are also accepting full-time uh, work positions to be posted and letting people know that those are available as well. And the last FBC, which I found very interesting, uh, the term baby boomers. So the 1946 to 1965 segment, and I don't know if you can see uh, behind me uh, our, our parapost, we had it made with our slogan, which was involving the term baby boomers. Uh, we were told that this is discriminatory. Uh, it's a bit denigrating. And the only thing I can do at this point, having printed, you know, this uh, poster is to apologize, um, but to find a term uh, which is something people appreciate. So today the webinar is, is mature workers. Uh, I've used the term older adults. Um, there's a number of different terms um, that we're still trying to decide uh, what's the best way to address our, our kijir uh, without them knowing what a kijir means, but to us, we know what it means. So if we move on to one more slide, I think I have. Yes, so I did catch the last bit of the questions being asked to Leslie about um, work and the transferable skills and um, language being an issue. 
And one of the things I would like to add to what he was saying is when you're looking at a job, um, understand that the job description, not everything is going to be included. And not everything in the description, in the description is 100% needed. So he was spe specifying the aspect of language, but it could be a number of other things. And it's a conversation I've had with a few employers in terms of asking them, you know, do you really need this person to know all of those different programming languages, or do you need them to know um, how to have this particular type of meeting? And the the thing is, it's more a question of just being able to say, you know what, I can do the majority of what's there. Um, and I know how to ask questions or get around the other things. Um, but don't be afraid to look at a job and have an interest in it, knowing that it's not everything is there uh, because of perhaps the soft skills that you have and that not everything is going to be needed. If we go to the next line. If it's a passion or a part of your experience, apply. I wholeheartedly encourage anybody who sees something that they either used to do or love to do as part of a, a pastime um, to apply anyway. Don't apply clearly to something where, you know, I've always wanted to be an artist and I cannot draw to save my life. But it's one of those things where, no, if I, I can draw a little bit and it's something that I'd like to explore. Maybe there's a way that I can contribute to this. Don't be afraid to apply. You may not uh, get the position, but you're going to go through the process and that experience of going through the process and getting yourself ready and perhaps even getting into the interview stage. It's very helpful and it's very rewarding. Let's go to the next one. Reach out to Kiji or the employer. So when we post um, jobs on our site, uh, it's very easy to apply directly on the website. You, it's a button, you click apply, and your application gets sent directly to the employer. And it's up to the employer to contact you. But if in the interim, or if you're not too sure about it, uh, reach out to us, uh, or even find out how you can get in touch with the employer to ask your questions. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a few questions before you decide to, to apply. And if anything, it engages the employer to understand that there's interest, uh, to understand that perhaps something was not clear, and it will help them ensure that they are getting uh, the right type of applicants. And I think I have one more up there. Wonderful. So a CV, a CV will get you noticed more than not having one. Um, our particular age bracket of the 55 and older, many people have not had to ever write a CV. Uh, many people have a very basic CV. And I know that this is a workshop Leslie's organization that Pascal offers in terms of assisting. But a CV uh, in the Kiji side of things is something that you can upload or you can just indicate your interests and your experience. But if you have a CV, if you have something that groups together uh, some of your accomplishments or the latest projects you've worked on, your languages that you've spoken to, your experiences in different types of industries, this is going to get you noticed a lot more than just putting your name and your email address down and saying, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, for work as, you know, an administrative assistant or um, as a IT programmer or something like this having a little bit more. And, and the reason really is a person that's probably looking at your application is used to seeing a CV and they'll, they'll kind of you know, move more towards that than, than not having one. So the last slide really is just my um, contact information and it is a call to say, join now. Uh, it's very simple, free and fast for both businesses and uh, older adults. And you can always email me directly for questions, Megan at kgagency.com. We are on a few social media. Uh, so we try to post a few fun things, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and whatnot. And you also have my phone number uh, to reach out and, and ask anything you'd like. That's great. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, that was super interesting. And I think this is a great idea, a great initiative. So I encourage anyone who has questions to put it in the chat box. 
Um, I have one here that I think, you know, is, is an interesting perspective for sure. And that's Megan, um, have you ever considered approaching an employer to consider if they have full-time opportunities to think about job sharing in the case of having two people share one role part-time? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's definitely something that was thought of uh, pre-pandemic even. So even though I know there's a lot of return to the workforce and people are trying to share the same desk space, for example, um, it's a part of the education side of things that we're trying to move forward with Kiji because we understand there's a need to educate the employer side about part-time work, about job sharing work, about older adults working and the benefits that you can have with them. So yes, it is um, something that uh, we have considered um, and we do, we do uh, speak to employers about it. Uh, it was something we spoke a lot at, uh, at trade shows when, when we were having trade shows, but it was something we spoke about there. Back when that was a thing. I, I have a question, actually. Um, maybe you can speak a little bit to how Kiji sort of screens employers. You talked about how you make sure that these are safe environments for older people. How do you make sure that your older adults are not going to fall victim to, you know, certain levels of employment circumstances that could be... Um, yeah, difficult. I understand. So there is a couple of things that we do. Uh, one is uh, by law, we're actually mandated to ensure that the location uh, we're sending somebody is safe and secure. So that is something that the to have our permits, we have a, a permit from the CNSST, uh, we are obliged to ensure. And how to do this, because say, for example, we have a position in Quebec City. Well, I'm in, in the West Island. I'm not going to travel to Quebec City every other day. As we ask the person to fill in a form, we also ask them to do a little bit of what we're doing. So take a laptop, show me around the location. Everybody can do a video conference these days. So let me see where the person's going to be. We keep in touch with the key gear as well before, during, and after the mandate. So do you understand that this is the job that is being asked of you? Are you capable of either standing or lifting or doing whatever it is that the job is required? And then when they are in place, we have a touch point with them as well as the employer to ask, you know, how things are going. Is there, are there any issues? Um, is it going well? Why is it going well? And then afterwards at the end um, to have that feedback because they may, the teacher may not have felt comfortable obviously speaking while they were employed, um, but to speak uh, to both the employer and the employee afterwards to find out, you know, how did it really go? Would you hire someone again? You know, what were some of the issues that you had? Um, so finding out um, also, sorry, at the very beginning, finding out what is around um, the environment. So uh, are, is, are, do you have access to um, public transportation? Is there coffee water, for example, that's there? Are there restaurants, you know, things like that? Are there stairs? Uh, or is there an elevator? So we would ask those questions beforehand. That's great. Maybe you can talk to them whether or not you're seeing any particularly interesting trends in what kind of employers are interested in working with older adults in the, I mean, I know you started up in the pandemic kind of put a glitch for you, but, but in the last couple of years, what you have been able to do, are you seeing any interesting trends? So the first trend uh, pre-pandemic, and I'll speak to it for a reason, is that um, there is a large number of people who wanted to work in the uh, long-term residence areas. Okay? They really wanted to have that companionship and, and helping people. Um, this has not really changed in terms of a desire to help others. It's just the unfortunate in terms of how you can do this. From there, there was a focus group we did, um, and John Buck, I saw him a little while ago, he was on, he attended uh, one of our focus groups uh, last year in February, and we were looking to see, you know, well, what are the trends? What are people looking for from both an employer perspective and, and a key gear perspective? And we had with the key gears a desire to work from home. Uh, the call center type of work, um, any kind of communications work, so something writing uh, oriented. There was, you know, uh, accounting. There was a huge influx of accountants, retired accountants that had signed up uh, wanting to work from home. There was also an interesting segment of people who wanted to return to a physical office environment, but with spacing. 
Um, so there was an interest in still being socially engaged, which is one of the things that, that we promote, but with uh, the rules in place, you know, will I have my own desk? Will there be masks? Will I have the sanitizer and things like that? Um, in terms of the, the types of work, that really hasn't changed. People really want to work in their own area. And this is another education point that, again, I defer to, to Leslie uh, a little bit in terms of what La Pascal offers, because it's that whole point of the transferable skill. And what we found is a lot of people don't understand the skills that they have and how to transfer them. So if you have start that conversation of saying, um, Leslie had mentioned, you know, problem solving as being one of the, the greatest things that you can, you can have and, and try to transfer that into different things. Well, identify for yourself, you know, what were those strengths and what you were doing, but you can probably take that out of your cubicle job that you once had and maybe even put it into an event-based job where you're outside and you're with a lot of people and things are moving a lot. So that is, is one of the areas I would say in terms of trends is people like doing what they've always been doing, but there is a need uh, to push people into another skill. And following up on that, um, a question sort of with the impact of the pandemic, are you seeing older adults being more hesitant to go back into the workforce or is it the opposite? Are they fed up of being stuck at home and are more keen to go out into the workforce? There's really a mix. Um, there's really a mix because my uh, mother-in-law, um, she would work the elections and it was, you know, hounding her to, to get back to, to try and, and do it. And she wanted to, she's like, no, no problem. But I don't know why they're, they're calling me every other day. And then I heard, um, you know, though there's a lot of people who, who don't want to go back to that role. And a lot of people who are doing the elections uh, were, were older adults. So there is a mix of people who, and she actually, sorry, also went and got herself a job too. But uh, so there's there's a mix of people who, uh, who, who want to and, and don't. But I also see the same uh, with people in their 30s and 40s. Yeah. No, I, I'm not surprised by that. I think it's I think it's true of everyone at this point. We're all ready, but we're also a little bit like, oh, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> yeah but dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Um, anybody else have any questions they want to put forward to Megan or even comments, things, situations that you've come across that you want to put out there? Silence, silence. Leslie, you got all the questions. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I, I, I mean, we can finish it up a little bit early then. So uh, thank you to everybody. Thank you so much to our excellent presenters, Leslie and Megan. Thank you to Ruth for finding our excellent presenters for us. Um, I think this is a really interesting topic that is going to evolve and change in the next few years because of the pandemic, because of demographics for so many different reasons. And so I'm hoping that we can continue this kind of conversation uh, in the future and, and see where everyone's at. If there are any follow-up questions, I'm just gonna put, you can contact uh, info at seniorsactionquebec.ca and I'll pass them along to either Leslie or Megan. Both, do you guys mind just popping your email address into the chat in case anybody wants to follow up with you and didn't write down your contact info? That would be great. Um, um, Vanessa, I have a quick question. Will we yeah. be getting a copy of the presentations or just maybe notes from the meeting? Uh, I haven't asked the presenters whether or not we have their permission to share okay. their uh, presentations. If we can, we will. Certainly there's the recording of the event. So that will be up on our website and we can share with everyone who wants. Okay. Um, and then if, if you need actual hard copies, just send me an email and I'll contact the speaker and see how they feel about that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Great. Uh, no thank you very much to the presenters. It was great. So yeah, I encourage everyone to, you know, keep their confidence levels up and yeah, just apply for the job, man. That whole fake it till you make it thing. That's, that's a real thing. <laughs> So everybody have a great day. Thank you for joining. I hope we see you at the next webinar on October 12th. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you, Megan. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. I gotta get out. Oh, how do I do?